baptized. So it's amazing. Um, we're in the Old Testament, and um, well, you can clap. There we go. That's wonderful, Bev. Wonderful. Why don't you breathe out? It's good. It's good to be in church. We don't have to rush off anywhere. We can devote this time to the Lord. We can rest. How many of you came in a little bit uh, uh, kind of anxious or a little bit irritable, and uh, already you just feel like there's been a release in your heart? It's the power of God at work in us. You know, when we come into um, the presence of the Lord, there is joy. And uh, it's no wonder that we walk into church services and we feel at home and we feel a sense of joy. And you can take courage in that, that that is God's doing in your life. It's a witness of the Holy Spirit in you. You feel part of family. You're reminded of your Father in heaven. Paul writes that it's the Spirit of God in us that cries out, Abba, Father. It's like, you know, we can't ignore our family relationship with our Father in heaven. And when we go through times and seasons where we uh, feel like God is distant, something happens, we come to church, we are reminded of a scripture, there's something in our hearts that just pulls us back to God. And uh, that should not be accompanied with guilt, but actually joy, that the Spirit of God will not let us run away. Wherever you go, there God will be also. You can't run away from God if He has set His love upon you. Amen. Genesis 12, verses 10 to 20 is where we will be reading this morning. And uh, the title of uh, the sermon is God, Our Provider and Protector. Let's read together from verse 10. There was famine in the land... um, if you've read verse tw- uh, chapter 12 up until this place we're launching into, you'll know that the land means the land of Canaan, where Abraham has now journeyed to. There was famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt to stay there for a while because the famine in the land was severe. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, Look, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Maybe some husbands should say that to their wives this morning. I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but let you live. Please say that you're my sister so that it will go well for me because of you, and my life will be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. So the woman was taken to Pharaoh's household. He treated Abram well because of her. And Abram acquired flocks and herds, male and female donkeys, male and female slaves and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh sent for Abram and said, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say that she's my sister? So that I took her as my wife. Now, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave his men orders about him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that the simple message that um, I believe you have for us this morning um, would do a deep work. And that, Lord, we would uh, praise you and glorify you that you are God, our protector and provider. That we would trust you in hard times and when the future looks bleak. And that you would save us from foolish decisions, Lord. That take us off course with your will for our life. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's backtrack a little bit and and look at the story. Abraham was a real-life guy. Okay, the Bible is truthful, speaking about real people in real times and real places and God's real workings in their life to bring about the conclusion of his salvation. Abraham came from a place called Ur. Do you want to throw that uh, Google Maps on the screen? There's Ur. Everyone say Ur. What a great name. Okay, so Ur is uh, kind of in the bottom southeastern part of modern day Iraq. And, um, and, and God um, uh, didn't speak to Abraham there. His father, uh, Terah, 
and had a couple of boys, and Abraham being one of them, and his brother's name was Haran, um, because it gets confusing. They're going to journey to a place called Haran. But Haran dies in Ur, the father of Lot, who's going to stick around with Abraham for a while. So Terah decides, hey, let's, let's leave Ur of the Chaldees, and let's move to Haran. You can just go to the next place. So that's just at the bottom of, of Turkey there is uh, where they think that this place Haran was. And then um, that's where God actually calls Abraham, comes to him. We read Genesis 12 verses 1. Hey, Abraham, um, leave your family, leave your hometown, leave your father's house, his care and protection, his provision, and move to a place that I'm going to show you. And so Abraham obeys God. And then we, we kind of see something weird happen. We thought God said, leave your relatives, but he takes Lot with him. And, and Lot's going to cause him some trouble later, but God will deal with that. So they move on down, and uh, they, they first comes to this place called Shechem, if I'm saying it right. It's uh, where this oak tree is. And, um, and God speaks to them, him there and says, hey, this is the land. You've arrived. I'm going to give your children this land. And then he journeys a little bit. It's very close. No, 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 just one back, sorry. Um, just stick there, Shechem, and then, uh, you know, a couple of kilometers further down, he gets to a place called Bethel, uh, Bethel um, means house of God, and that's where he calls upon the name of the Lord, and he does well there, and then it says that he journeyed with his uh, whole entourage down to the Negev, which you can go to the next, which is um, basically some barren land right at the southern uh, part of Palestine, modern day, it's like a desert region, although maybe he was a bit closer to the coast and maybe there was some good vibes there. But uh, he basically journeyed down the length of this land that he was to inherit. Um, and then things get really tough. And uh, this is where we read the story that there was a famine that was really severe in the land. And all of a sudden, Abram decides, hey man, Egypt's looking pretty sweet there. There's some green river valley. And he cruises to Egypt. And that's where we are. Okay, a couple of things to notice in this story. The, the, the writers of um, the Bible are very clever. They don't always write in a way that's morally prescriptive. In other words, they don't say, and Abraham did this and it was a bad decision. As you get to know the character of God and the way God deals with his people and the plan and the purpose of God, so the more you read your Bible, you start to pick up some things. Hey, what's missing here? Abraham never called on the Lord about this Egypt decision. He didn't inquire of the Lord. What did God say? Go to Canaan. I'm going to provide for you there. I'm going to give your children this land. What does Abraham do? It gets a bit tough in the promise. Oh God, you're a bit slow to fulfill things here. I'm going to head to Egypt. And what's also missing is that we have no interaction or no voice of God in the time that Abraham is in Egypt. And it's pretty obvious that he sacrifices or is willing to sacrifice Sarah, his wife, the very one through whom this child, this promised child is going to have to come. And God has to radically intervene by his grace to save Abram and Sarah from actually ruining his plan. I don't know um, if you've uh, watched much sport but um, how many times have you watched your favorite team? And uh, they might just be winning, just. And in the last 10 minutes, what happens? They make dumb decisions. And they throw the game away. Why? Because the last 10 minutes is the hardest time of the game. Your body's tired. You're not thinking clearly. You're fatigued. And all of a sudden, the pressure's on, and you start to make foolish decisions. I've made a couple of those foolish decisions, like, uh, like um, when you have the ball and there's like 30 seconds left and then you kick it into the opposition's hands and they score a try. And you feel great with your team after the game. Everyone knew you, lo you lost the game. But here's, here's what I'm trying to get at, is that when times get tough, aka when there's a famine in the land, it can breed fear in our hearts and then we make foolish decisions. And, and if I can frame right now with uh, the price of diesel possibly going to 27 rand a liter and um, 
as much as they're trying to arrest people for corruption, it seems like it's never ending. And prices of food going up and bad news and war and things are tough in this country and things are tense. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, forces and um, hostilities that Satan loves to try and keep working at. And uh, we feel under pressure as the people of God. And we feel pressure in uh, the place of promise or the place that God has brought us to be his witnesses, to live. Um, remember, we talked a couple of weeks ago that um, God's plan uh, for Abraham was just a foreshadowing of the ultimate reality in, in that uh, we as the people of God are like, we're in our Canaan. We, we're going to inherit this earth. God is going to, as Renus uh, read to us from Revelation 21, God's dwelling place will be with us. And he will renew all things, a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. Um, but this land is, is still defiled by sin. And so we're living in this Canaan and sometimes it's like, man, I want to ship out and make a, a better decision than when God has brought me. I'm not necessarily calling Middleburg your promised land or Canaan, but, but for, for, I would say for 99% of you here, God has brought you here. And he intends to provide for you here and protect you here. And in hard times, we sometimes overstretch and overreach and try to take matters into our own hands to provide and protect for ourselves. And we make foolish decisions. And that's the simplicity of my message this morning, that God is our provider and our protector. Let's beware of foolish decisions in this time when times in the last 10 minutes of the game when it gets tough. Egypt was not where God had called Abram. He's willing to sacrifice the gift of his wife through whom God will fulfill his promise. And by God's grace, he brings restoration, but it comes at great cost. You know, it's not fully explained, but you can, I mean, just imagine yourself. You move to Joburg, and, um, and, and, you, and you, in, in some way, you sacrifice your wife's well-being for your business interests. I, I don't think that's going to produce the most trust-loving, kind relationship between you and your wife. I think that's probably going to have an emotional cost that's going to have, uh, uh, that's going to put a burden on you that you're going to have to work out. It wasn't God's intention for Abram and Sarai to get into that place. The crazy thing is that, um, like I said, um, during this time, we don't see uh, the blessing of intimacy between Abraham and God. It's only when um, God brings Abraham and Sarai back out of Egypt, they go back to the desert, um, and then they journey up to um, uh, uh, Bethel again, and Lot separates from them. And as soon as Lot separates from them, God speaks to Abraham again about the land and said, this is the land, and this is where I'm going to bless you, and this is where I'm going to bring your offspring. So, we met as men on, um, on Friday, and it was really good. I have a burden on my heart because men, uh, by nature of the fact that God has called men to lead their households, it's usually men that make big decisions on behalf of households and sometimes in troubled time can actually make serious decisions that have uh, bad consequences for the rest of their families. And so, uh, although this is a message to challenge all of us in terms of making decisions in hard times, um, I want to specifically also just emphasize our role as men and to say be watchful about the kind of decisions you make under pressure. So these are just coming, some examples that I just prayed and I said, God, give, would you give me some examples? And, and maybe some of us are in these examples. And I just want to tell you that, um, that, I, that, that no one here is perfect. And, and once again, I don't preach down to you. I've made some pretty poor decisions in my life. Um, in fact, I've actually taken our family to a place that didn't yield good f fruit in terms of spiritual, spirituality and health for, for my marriage. And I had to recognize this is not good. And, uh, and when, when we actually got back on track, and, and it was something that God had to deal with me in, uh, we experienced the fruitfulness um, of God again when actually I recognized that was a really poor decision. 
And so we need to humble ourselves when we recognize bad decisions and when someone points it out to us. But um, in these times, we can um, make very high-risk, foolish financial decisions to try to get ahead. So the, uh, the world is full of like big offers of big reward now. NFTs, I don't even understand it. Bitcoin, you know, f- promises of 30, 40% return. If it was true, everyone would be doing it and winning. Trading. So, so, some, so some of us have taken, you know, uh, long-term savings. And then we put it in a high-risk thing because we're trying to get ahead quickly. And uh, I want to say to you, under times of financial pressure, beware of making poor decisions like that. That's going to put your family at high risk. And it's going to put you under a tremendous amount of stress. Because nine times out of ten, that doesn't end well. Overstretching for more wealth. I believe we must learn to be content. And I believe actually that our financial prosperity and the growth and the increase that God brings is of his hand. And, and, he call, and, 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 I, and I don't doubt that there's people that have unique business gifting and intuition and they're just able to see opportunity. This is none of that. I'm not talking about good risk in business, you know, for, for great reward. I'm talking about making a foolish decision because you're, over, you, 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 you're trying to grab for something. You get frustrated with what you do not have. And so we, we, all of a sudden we don't turn to God. We turn to, 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 um, to that Facebook advert that promises us $2,000 a month extra if we just do X, Y, and Z. I mean, literally, Vanessa and I once, we, um, we did marriage counseling with a couple in, um, in Pretoria. And, uh, and, and their goal was to write, retire at 35. So, so what that meant for their life is like, we're gonna, we, by nature of what we're going to do, we're going to isolate ourselves. We're going to, we're going to uh, do our day jobs we're going to do seven other online jobs, and we're going to be part of a network marketing, you know, when you use your friends to sell Tupperware to them, that thing. <laughs> then, then, and, uh, and, and they just became this little island. But great that you're going to retire at 35. But I, but I don't see, like, fruitful. Are you, like, are, you, are you enjoying your relationships now? Are you part of church community now? Do you realize that life is not a destination? It's a journey. Do you realize that God has given you grace for today, not for 35 years old? And so uh, we've seen people just make radical decisions, trying to stretch for something, and it's like, no, no, no. Actually, the people of God are meant to live by the daily provision of God. That's not to say we don't plan and provide for the future, but I think, you can deter- I think if, you, if, you, if you ask God for wisdom, He can help you deter- to distinguish between the two. Make sure you enjoy life now. Make sure your family enjoys life now. Don't put everything away for one day. And you forget to live and bless your kids now. And, and, and buy your wife some good clothes now. And, and spoil your family. Yeah. Um, super practical service this sermon this morning. Um, mo- moving or immigration decisions that come at a high cost to your marriage, your family in your spiritual life. If God hasn't called you to Australia, you don't want to take your family to Australia because if God has not given you the grace to live in Australia, let me tell you, let me just quickly, you know, just, you know. For many South Africans, we just feel like we're just going to get along so well in Australia. Let me tell you the reality of moving to any other country. Let me, why don't we ask the Zimbabweans what it feels like to come to South Africa? And feel like you're not taken seriously. And feel like you, your, your qualifications are doubted. And feel like you're neither here nor there. And all, um, um, I'm saying this because actually they could teach us something about moving to another country. It's not as easy as you think it is. And if God has not called you, then it's going to come at great cost. How do we make big moving decisions, you know, whether it's to an, another city or another country or whatever? We, we, we make sure that God has made it clear that there's an open door that we're running into. Because if we make moving decisions, immigration decisions, on the basis of running away from, it's already a red light that actually maybe this is not the right decision. 
If we're making immigration decisions and it's going to cause separation as husband and wife, oh, don't go there. If you make immigration or big moving decisions and your family is in total disarray and disagreement and there's no peace about it, don't try force it. Wait for the open door. Wait for the, the ease of grace that God will, he will, he will bring something of an invitation. But don't make these big decisions on your own in times of pressure because you want to run away from something. Um, in, in, in hard times, we can get so busy with trying to uh, just get through the season. You know, we're going to come to church when we're just finished with this season. Um, we're so busy right now. In order to, 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 to make it happen, uh, we've, got, we've got to burn the, the candle at both ends. I've got three businesses running. And you know what? Um, next year we'll have time for church, but we've just got to get through this now. Is, is, is not a good decision. Friends, our God is a father. For sure, does he, does he bring us through challenging times? But he doesn't bring us into a space where we are squashed and we have to burn. We, we, we have to lose sleep to try and make a buck. He gives, we, we need to read the Bible and recognize these promises are true for us. He gives rest to the righteous. And some of us, for sure, we're working tough shift work. And I'm, this is not about that. But if, 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 if you're just trying to make decisions... That they're going to just give you a little, that little bit extra, and it's sacrificing the major big things in life, like family life and church community, because you're fearful of the hard times you're living in. It's not a good decision. Lastly, in hard times or in challenging times, we can make decisions that override um, biblical teaching on morals and ethics. So, we live together before it's, we married because apparently it's too expensive to do otherwise. We, I don't know, make questionable business decisions because that's the way business is done in South Africa. And I'm not going to get business without doing that. And I'm just saying the people of God are called to live under the blessing of God. God promises his protection and his provision. And he doesn't promise it and say, oh, well, but you're going to have to do a couple of devious things. Or you're going to have to go against my obvious will in order to achieve that. And so I just want to call us all. It's not pointing the finger at anyone. But I want to call us all into, like, it's just a standard of, I trust God, and I'm going to do it His way in hard times, and He's going to bless us as a result. If you have made any one of those decisions, and you sit here and you think, oh, I feel a bit guilty about that, um, the point is not to condemn you, but let your guilt drive you to repentance and say, God, I want to live differently from now on. I believe we are called to live um, our lives on the basis of God's call and His promises over our lives and His grace that supplies our need because He's bringing those promises to fulfillment. So if, it's God, if God has called us to live in South Africa, and for most of us He has, and if He's called us to right now work a job in Middleburg, then God will give us the grace to live here. And He will bless us in this place. The amazing thing about Abram is that uh, he faltered significantly, I would say three times, maybe you can point out more to me, in terms of his trust um, that God is uh, provider, protector, and promise keeper. Maybe that should be the title, title of my sermon. Provider and protector, he gets challenged in this Egypt thing. He gets challenged again and, and, and he makes a bad decision again. He makes the same decision twice, by the way. And we look at Abraham, we're like, how could you say that your wife is your sister twice, with Pharaoh and with Abimelech in Gerar? And then we just have to think, okay, but how many times have I made the same bad decision twice? So it's humbling. 
And, um, and then when, 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 when Sarai conveniently offers him uh, uh, the servant girl to, uh, to fulfill the promise, he jumps at the opportunity. I sometimes wonder what was going through Abram's mind. I don't think you haven't thought that thought. I don't say you haven't thought it. So um, the amazing thing is Abraham actually, by the end of his life, he's actually learned something of God's protection and his provision. In Genesis 15, he, um, Lot causes him some trouble. Uh, this king called Chedorlaomer comes in with a bunch of other allied kings, um, takes Lot in his possessions and because he's at war with some of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah where Lot is living. Anyway, Lot gets caught up in this battle and Abram has to take 318 or 314 men and uh, go and rescue Lot. And he succeeds and he, and he defeats uh, Chedorlaomer, this king. And, uh, and then straight after that, um, he meets with uh, Melchizedek, this priest from Salem, and he, and he honors God with his wealth by giving him a tenth of it, all he had. And then um, Abraham, um, God meets Abraham directly after this, and he says to him, it says, after these events, that's, that's Abraham rescuing Lot from Chedorlaomer and his allies, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision and said, do not be afraid, Abraham, I am your shield, your reward will be very great. God starts to actually speak to Abraham about the fact that, Abraham, I want you to know that I'm your rock and your shield and your, protect, your protector. David realizes this later in his life too. In 2 Samuel 22, it says after he wrote the song, after um, God had saved him from his enemies and also from the hands of Saul. And, and, God, and David had many Ab enemies in his life, even his own son at some stage turned against him. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, where I seek refuge. My shield, the horn of my salvation. My stronghold, my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I was saved from my enemies. I want to ask you um, that in the midst of hard times coming, when you, when you read the news again, when, when, when News 24 uh, gives the AA report and said, um, unprecedented fuel increase on the horizon that you just say God you are my rock and my shield and my great reward when you read of the crime stats in this country just remember God you are my rock my shield my reward is great in you it's amazing Abraham learns God's provision you know he doubts God's provision a lot in this journey but later on in life at Genesis 22 by the time God can ask Abraham something so ridiculous as to give up his son through whom this promise would come. Abraham's willing to do it, and Isaac's like, where's this, uh, where's this sacrifice, Dad? Abraham said, um, the Lord will provide. And in Genesis 22 verse 14, that's where we hear um, Abraham for the first time reference God as Jehovah Jireh. God, our provider. It says, Abraham named that place the Lord will provide. So today it is said, I will be provi it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. And the apostle Paul learned of God's provision as he traveled from place to place, planting churches, relying on people's generosity and the work of his hands. And he said he has learned contentment. He's had times of much, times of little. But God has always supplied his every need. And he says in Philippians 4 verse 19 to encourage the church, he says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so I believe in these times when there's bad news and it's hard, God wants to remind us this morning that he's our protector, our provider, and he's the promise keeper over what he said he was going to do. And he's going to fulfill it in our lives. So why don't we stand together? I just pray this morning that God puts courage in your hearts, no matter what you're facing. Who's under stress this morning? Who's got financial stress bearing down upon them? Who can't pay the bills? Who feels the pinch of our times? Who feels a bit 
kind of like despondent about the future of our country and about the times we're living in. Why don't you bring that before God this morning and say, God, spare me from making foolish decisions in this time. Help me to take each day as it comes. Show me, Lord, that you are my protector and my provider and increase my trust in you in Jesus' name. Let's sing together.